Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. So today we are going to be talking about mushrooms, Uh not just mushrooms as food or the psychedelic properties of mushrooms, but rather the ecological lessons, Uh, fungi as decomposers, as symbionts, as potential building materials. And our guest is a longtime friend of mine, uh, someone I knew from the time he was quite young, Merlin Sheldrake a mycologist, botanist, naturalist, and an excellent writer whose recent book, Entangled Life, is a bestseller. Well, let's welcome him. Merlin Sheldrake is a biologist and the best-selling author of Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our World, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures. He received a PhD in tropical ecology from Cambridge University. Merlin is a brewer and a fermenter, and he's fascinated by the relationships that arise between humans and other organisms. Welcome, Merlin. Thanks, Victoria. It's great to be here. I want to start with then a concept of symbiosis, which is a major theme of your book. You remind us that all life is interdependent, which is really an ecological perspective. And I'm hoping you can give some examples. There are so many examples, and we can think of ourselves as symbiotic organisms. Um, I'm sure you've discussed the microbiome on on your podcast uh, in past episodes, and And we contain um, many, many microbes, more microbial cells than our own cells, bacterial cells, fungal cells. And we wouldn't be able to grow and reproduce and behave as we do without these organisms that live in and on us. Uh, And so you can think of us as uh, as a collective, as as a kind of ecosystem. But this runs all the way down. Bacteria, large bacteria can have smaller bacteria living inside them. Even uh, large viruses can have small viruses living inside them. So really there is nothing in life which is not symbiotic. It's it's really symbiotic symbiosis all the way down. Donna Haraway had a great line that the the smallest unit of analysis is is the relationship. And Mm. I think this is one of the insights that thinking about symbiosis brings. So Andy, I want to pointed to you and and, um, wondering how you have thought about an ecological perspective and integrative medicine. You know, uh, I remember going to mushroom conferences in the early days in the 1970s. And I remember hearing for the first time about mycorrhizal relationships that trees, uh, the root hairs of trees were sheathed with uh, mycelium of mushrooms and that the two organisms needed each other. And that was, to me, that was a revolutionary idea. I'd never heard that before in my studies of biology. And then as I found that this really extended to all plants, not just trees, and that there is this web the entangled web of life that Merlin has written very lyrically about. And we are connected with that as well. You know, we are one with that. So I think one thing to learn from all this is that there's no such thing as separation, that we're not separate. I think that's just remarkable. Also that while there are uh, hostile organisms out there, organisms that can do us harm, it is also possible to live in, if not mutually beneficial, at least neutral relationships with them. And I think in integrative medicine, that's a a major philosophical point. Rather than trying to wipe out what we see as bad organisms, uh, it's possible to increase natural defenses so that we strike a balance with them. That's so interesting, isn't it? This idea of balance and context. There's this, um, as well as the uh, the mycorrhizal fungi that live in plant roots, there are f- uh, fungi that live in plant leaves and in plant mm-hmm. shoots called endophytic fungi. And there's a great study that came out recently talking about a fungus which causes a disease called watery soft rot. It causes plants to soften and uh, lose their various parts of their bodies. And the, the study showed that if you infect this pathogenic fungus, what we think of as a pathogenic fungus with a virus, the fungus stops being a pathogen and switches to become a mutually beneficial endophyte, (laughs) (laughs) um, which protects the plant from disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think this really illustrates this point so so well, that rigid categories don't do as much good when we're thinking Mm -hmm. about the world of relationships. 
So you used a few words that some of our listeners may not be especially familiar with, mycorrhizal relationships and mycelium. I'm wondering if we could just take one step backwards and, and give some definitions. Most fungi live most of their lives as mycelium, which is a branching, fusing network of tubular cells. And it's how fungi feed. It's a way for them to insinuate themselves with their surroundings, which they then digest and absorb. Mushrooms are just the fruiting bodies of fungi. So they're the places where the fungi produce spores and uh, which allow them to disperse themselves. You know, in integrative medicine, we are uh, teaching physicians to use medicinal mushrooms, and there's tremendous interest in this at the moment, and also a great deal of commercial activity around uh, mushroom products and medicinal mushrooms and research on this. And one of the questions that comes up is, is it desirable to take just the mycelium of mushroom, of medicinal mushrooms or better take the fruit bodies or take both? You know, is, or do these have different chemistry, different properties? Are there answers to these questions? I think this, this debate has become quite polarized and I don't mm. think it needs to be polarized at all. The different parts of the fungal organism do different things. They have different biological roles and they are metabolically active in different kinds of ways. And you, you only need to look at a, say, a mushroom, a, a reishi mushroom with a shiny brown scalp on the top to know that the mushroom produces pigment compounds that are not found in the mycelium, which are not shiny and brown. Mm -hmm. So, I think it depends on what you're looking for. So, uh, if, for example, if we're talking about psilocybin mushrooms and using those in a medicinal context, then psilocybin is produced in the mushrooms, but not on the whole in the mycelium. And so there'd be no point taking mycelium if you wanted to have a psilocybin uh, medicinal experience. And so I think the question is, what compounds are you interested in and where are those produced? And that will vary from mushroom to mushroom mm -hmm. and, and from complaint to complaint because different fractions of bioactive compounds are produced in uh, different relations in the mycelium and the fruit body. So I think it's an it depends answer. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I want to pull us now back out a little bit. Andy, I've sometimes heard you say that all countries are either mycophilic, meaning they love mushrooms, or my mycophobic, meaning they fear mushrooms. And why is that? I mean, we're not particularly that way about plants, although I guess we have some uh, history with plants as well. Well, first of all, I didn't say that, Victoria. I was quoting Gordon Wasson, who was uh, the first person, the person ah. who rediscovered the use of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico mm -hmm. and wrote a monumental work called Mushrooms, Russia, and History. And he proposed that all cultures can be divided into mycophilic and mycophobic. Uh, the Slavic cultures, he was married to an ethnic Russian woman, which started him on this. The Slavic cultures, Asian cultures are generally very mycophilic. And the English-speaking world is that the opposite pole of mycophobia. You know, why this is, I have no idea. And one odd example from the East is that in India, in yoga philosophy, mushrooms are classified in the lowest energetic category of foods that also includes spoiled and rotten things. So that's an exception. But I remember growing up in my household, my mother was deathly afraid of mushrooms. And she thought that uh, she didn't buy supermarket mushrooms because she thought a poisonous one could have slipped in. And she warned me not to touch mushrooms that came up on our lawn because they were probably poisonous. So that was an attitude that was very common in the culture that I grew up with. Merlin, do you have an answer for why we have this cultural divide? Well, I think it's maybe a little bit less clear cut in, in many cases. For example, I read a, a paper recently talking about the attitudes to mushrooms of indigenous peoples in the far eastern, the Kamchatka Peninsula, so the very far, far east of Russia. And historically, in the early part of the 20th century, they were pretty mycophobic, if to, to use Wasson's classification mushrooms were not sort of as uh, as things that could be harvested and eaten in, in any kind of uh, serious way but influenced by russian the communist russians and um, border guards and and other officials who were very keen on mushrooms this mm. culture has flipped into a into a uh, heady mycophilia in a post communist era so i think these categories can be very fluid 
But as to why these, I mean, it's, it's definitely pronounced that you have you know, the English speaking world is on the whole um, less into mushrooms than, um, than other cultures than Slavic and East Asian cultures. But why that is, I, I'm not sure. It might have something to do with the fact that the uh, Western taxonomic system has a very poor grasp of mushrooms um, since the classical period. And, and so it's much, if so without a good way, a reliable way to order and to uh, discern um, poisonous mushrooms from non-poisonous mushrooms, and uh, perhaps sprung up this air of caution that you shouldn't touch, like Andy's mother warning him that he shouldn't touch the mushrooms on the lawn in case they were poisonous, because without a reliable way to tell whether they were poisonous, it's actually quite a, a rational attitude. I had dinner uh, some years ago with a man, a, a native Austrian, who was the technical director of uh, one of the very large uh, producers of botanical medicines, very good quality. And he had lived all over the world. And he said that he was struck by how fearful the English speaking world was of nature in contrast to Germanic speaking uh, countries. So maybe the attitude toward mushrooms is a, a part of something larger there. Yeah. Um, and it might also be to do with the death and decay, the association yep. of mm -hmm. mushrooms with death and decay and the need for certain human cultures to, to elevate themselves above those. And they appear out of nowhere. You know, it's hard to understand how mushrooms grow. And that must have been very mysterious and puzzling to people and magical and maybe also caused fear and wonder. <laughs> so the death and decay is also associated with something that is now being seen as one of the great talents of uh, mushrooms, which is uh, decomposition. And the hope that some species may actually be the solution for toxic waste that we actually have no idea how to break down and, and make safe again. What do you think is the full potential for fungi in this uh, particular arena? I think there's huge potential. Uh, and this has been demonstrated in countless studies that have shown fungi to have a powerful appetites for all sorts of compounds that we think of as, as pollutants. Applying these these findings to real world scenarios with polluted environments is much more complicated because you you can't always just inoculate an environment with a with, no, with an organism and expect it to thrive and and what's more the history of human interventions ecologically speaking meaning well uh, has is littered with disasters we've introduced many different species to many different environments and it's all just gone wrong so it's not straightforward i think some of the perhaps more practicable approaches are those that involve having, uh, rather than waiting till a pollutant has ended up in the environment, is to divert uh, pollutants on their way to the environment and then break them down in specially built facilities where you can house the fungi in ideal conditions in big vats and fermenters. And all of this kind of technology is very well established. What do you think about the potential for uh, obtaining quantities of high quality protein from mushrooms and having this be a new food source that might uh, replace some of the animal foods that we're now dependent on? I think this is very exciting, um, especially mycelium-based foods, mm -hmm. um, using mycelium either as a scaffold for other types of cellular uh, agriculture or just eating various different types of processed mycelium. If you think about like, miso, it's a kind of um, mycelium food. You know, you, you grow a mycelium through grains or through beans. And what you're eating in the end is digested grains and beans, but also a lot of mycelium. Same with tempeh. So uh, there's, there's a history of this. It's, it's, it's rich culinary history. And I think it uh, has a lot of potential moving forward because you'd be able to grow mycelium in, uh, very quickly in controlled conditions, which don't depend on clearing forests or, or otherwise um, disrupting um, ecosystems. Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. During this unprecedented time managing the physical and emotional challenges of the coronavirus, the Andrew Weil Center is here to support you. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. One particular place that almost all of us are familiar with 
fungi has to do with fermentation of yeast. And uh, most of us enjoy uh, an occasional alcoholic beverage or perhaps a piece of bread. And uh, those are really you know, the the magic of uh, adding yeast to other substances. And I understand that you have been a, a brewer and a fermenter and you tell some um, wonderful stories. Andy, you as well have been a bread baker and I don't know as much about your brewing history, but maybe speak to that use of uh, fungi a bit. Well, I make, uh, I'm not so much of a brewer, but I have been making uh, tempeh fairly regularly, natto, another, uh, which actually Merlin and I conferred on, fermented beverages like Foss made from beets. I'm a great fan of fermented foods. And as you know, Victoria, we recommend them very frequently to our patients because I think this is one of the best things that you can do for your gut microbiome. It's amazing the process of fermenting as well. I, I, I like doing it not only for the flavors and for the, the health benefits, but, but also for the experience of watching um, and experiencing the, I mean, with your taste, tasting an ecosystem arise and transform over time. When you have a, a bottle of beetroots fermenting into kvass, for example, on your kitchen worktop, there's an ecological succession, of different waves of microbes taking over from the previous ones where they left off, which is very much how ecosystems work in the wild, out in the big world outside. And in the jar, however, you can taste it happening. You can taste these chemical transformations if you taste the, the ferment as it goes along. And you can really get an intuitive sense for how much of the world really works in these big chemical weather systems that we live within, but are too large for us to notice. You know, one of my very early memories is, I, I think I was quite young, occasionally my mother and grandmother would make raised donuts and they used fresh cake yeast. And I remember the smell of that uh, when it was dissolved and began to work. I found so attractive. It was one of the most alluring aromas. I, I was just completely drawn to that. It's a, it's a, also it's amazing in the natural world how um, how yeasts play a part in um, pollination stories. There's a type of shrew called the Malaysian tree shrew, which is attracted to the fermenting um, sugary nectar in palm flowers, and the smell of this fermentation it actually attracts the shrews to their flowers. And the shrews have a way of um, drinking this alcohol without getting terribly yeah. drunk. They, <laughs> they have <a> special <laughs> turbocharged enzymes. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, these, these aromas produced by the yeast actually are folded into the life cycles of, of many organisms. Mm -hmm. So we are taping this during the pandemic. And apparently, there has been this enormous increase in interest in growing mushrooms. And um, recently, the New York Times quoted a supplier in Portland who said the demand had increased 400% over the past year. So perhaps the U.S. is moving from being mycophobic to mycophilic. What, what would account for that? <laughs> I think mushrooms are really having a moment um, and fungi more, <laughs> fungi more generally. And I think that in lockdown, people have been taking on all sorts of new projects like baking, for example, another fungal, um, another fungal enterprise, of course. Um, but the mushroom growing is, it's so amazing when you grow mushrooms. You see them grow and they grow so fast. I think there's a, there's a fantastic thrill there in seeing uh, this transformation taking place from a block of mycelium growing on waste material into these forms that just arise. You can almost see them grow. You know, I remember when growing mushrooms when I was a child and I would go to bed and they would be I don't know, a certain size and then I'd wake up in the morning and they've doubled in size more or less. <laughs> Andy, why do you think that fungi are having such a moment? Well, you know, one reason certainly has to do with psilocybin mushrooms, and uh, there certainly has an incredible resurgence of interest in them. Everywhere that I have gone to speak in the past, I'd say in the past three years, no matter what the subject, whether it's about nutrition, healthy aging, integrative medicine, I get questions from all sorts of audiences about psilocybin and how can I do it and what about microdosing and what are the benefits and uh, it's phenomenal to me how this has penetrated the culture. I assume that's the same in the UK and uh, and in other countries now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a massive, massive boom, driven, of course, in part by these studies. Most studies into new phenomena don't tend to generate this much 
excitement and fascination. So there's something else to it as well. Well, I think it, it, it is penetrating mainstream culture in a remarkable way. And I must say, I, I feel very good about that. You know, maybe this is specifically the antidote to the toxicity of the cult of the dominant culture uh, and may bring about, you know, very good change. I know you have a long history of mushroom hunting uh, and fermenting, but what's your favorite way to, to stay in contact with the fungal world right now? Well, I'm a, li a bit limited living in the Sonoran Desert, you know, which is not the best habitat for mushrooms. We get uh, good fruitings of mushrooms on top of the Santa Catalina Mountains in the summer rains. And in, when there are very heavy rains, which there have not been for a while, the desert floor fruits with some very unusual species like stalk falls. So whenever I can be in contact with those, uh, that makes me very happy. I've always loved mushroom hunting in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, which is a wonderful habitat. There are more and more people cultivating edible species, which is a delight. Uh, I had some very good uh, fresh lion's mane mushrooms from a local cultivator a couple of nights ago. So I eat them whenever I can. I consume medicinal mushrooms in various forms uh, because I think they're doing good things for my immunity and, and body defenses and mental function. Andy, you brought up lion's mane, which is a mushroom that you commonly recommend to people who are worried about their brains. Can you maybe give an integrative medicine tip to our listeners about the value of lion's mane mushroom? Well, it has a unique nerve growth factor in it, and there is some good research uh, suggesting that this benefits uh, neurological health and cognitive function. Uh, it is perfectly safe. It has no toxicity. It's something that can, it's also a delicious edible mushroom. Uh, it can be cultivated. There are many lion's mane products out there. Um, and it is one that I commonly recommend to people. And it's an example in what fills a gap that we don't have anything for in conventional medicine. Uh, so people with uh, neuropathies, with uh, cognitive deficits are worried about that. I think it's a very good remedy to take and there's no downside to it. And it's delicious. And it's delicious. It. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Your book title speaks to the possibility of changing our minds. And you give so many different reasons from uh, the relational qualities to symbiosis to how we view intelligence. But presumably, you're also thinking about how psychedelics change one's mind. Definitely. Yeah, that was um, that's the most literal level, I think. They have powerful impacts on cultures and more generally. And you can see that in a big way, say, in the 1950s, moving through into the 60s, as psychedelics became um, taken in more mainstream ways. And those, it's the huge changes that those countercultural movements brought about. And yet we know that now some of the interest um, is in folks who are not necessarily in the countercultural, but very much in the mainstream, including uh, Silicon Valley types and people at the end of life uh, who want help as they face their own death. Absolutely. And it's amazing to see these, these astonishing effects, these really, I mean, psychedelic effects are so wide ranging and difficult to difficult to quantify um, but it's fascinating to see these studies really start to get a grip on on how they can be used to help people in particular settings for particular problems and many of these ways that psychedelics seem to help people in depression for example or in anxiety and when faced a when facing a terminal diagnosis is through uh, by softening the edges of ourselves, by creating a kind of sense of ego dissolution, of losing track of where we end and where our surroundings begin. I think this is one of the things that funky can do more generally. They make questions of our categories, and particularly our categories of selfhood and individuality. And I think this tells us something about the problems that we have that arise in our culture, or in, in the you know, various different cultures, when we think about things as separated from each other by neat boundaries, by distinct uh, edges, by hard edges. Um, for example, when we think about the living world as made up of, of neatly bounded individuals, we lose track of what connects them, of the various processes that uh, weave them together in the course of their lives. Uh, so I think this speaks to this much bigger issue at play right now, the kind of medicine that, that I think mm -hmm. our culture needs a softening up, can we grow the boundaries of ourselves? 
That's beautifully said. Another place that you challenge the boundaries is when you speak about fungi having intelligence and you say, fungi don't have a brain. Uh, they're one-celled organisms. Uh, Andy, some years ago, you recommended a book to me called The Soul of an Octopus. And part of that book uh, is a focus on how intelligent octopus are, even though they have such a different brain than human beings and a distributed multicellular, perhaps, brain. Where do we go with this? I mean, you know, it really does profoundly push against what we think about as intelligence. I think it's exciting, partly because it helps to puncture our greatly overinflated human centeredness and species narcissism and <laughs> cerebrocentrism. <laughs> We're very proud of our brains, and understandably so. <laughs> but, um, but I think it leads us into trouble where, where we place ourselves at the top of the intelligence rankings. Um, we create hierarchies with us invariably, you know, sitting somewhere at the top. And we use ourselves as yardsticks by which to judge the abilities and, and, and possibilities uh, faced by other organisms. So the idea that brains aren't the only way to solve problems, that brains aren't the only way to deal intelligently with the various um, puzzles that are presented to living organisms, I think is very helpful for us. And, and also it reflects a deeper evolutionary reality that brains didn't evolve their tricks from scratch. Uh, and you know, what electrically excitable cells um, strung into networks um, brains are just one example of that. And um, even in bacterial colonies, you can have waves of electrical ex excitation that pass over uh, these bacterial colonies and allow them to communicate with different areas, you know, different parts of the colony connected to different and uh, what high nutrients over here and low nutrients over there. Um, so you don't even need to be a multicellular organism mm -hmm. to, to, to signal using waves of electrical activity, let alone a complex, uh, higher one like us. Well, Merlin, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and also for writing your wonderful book, which I'm just going to say that I listened to. So not only did I have uh, the pleasure of your words, but I had the pleasure of your voice. And so I want to recommend to people Entangled Life. Um, it's it's a wonderful read or a wonderful listen. And thank you for being with us. Yeah, I would add, it's an inspirational book and really gives a a vision of the natural world that is so much more exciting and uh, complete than, than certainly the one that I grew up with. And really seeing everything is interconnected and communicating. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience to read that book. Well, thank you both so much for your kind words and for having me on. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. Learn more about topics featured on the Body of Wonder podcast and how to apply them to your everyday health with My Wellness Coach, a free mobile app from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Download today at mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu. That's mywellnesscoach.arizona.edu.